the Mukadex surgery as um, you know there is a team of cardiac surgeon anesthetist cardiologist and the radiologist we all work together and this is more and more true uh, with the uh, the new technology in card techniques in cardiac surgery particularly minimal access where we're requesting more and more CT scan in order to see the structure before going ahead with the operation just to let you know that in in the country with about three thirty five thousand uh, procedure a year. The majority is coronary bypass, then it's aortic valve replacement and uh, the survival rate is quite quite good for, for coronary bypass mortality is only 1.4, 1.6. Aortic valve in the country is 2%. We have zero mortality for aort first time aortic valve replacement in the last four years and all other all cardiac surgery is about 96% survival rate which is quite Quite good, and and they, they are these are the different uh, procedure we perform. Uh, the, the first one being the cabbage valve mitral tricuspid heart failure surgery door Batista. We don't do it anymore. Surgical AF ablation for long-standing persistent totally endoscopy procedure. Aortic dissection, aortic arch surgery, ROS procedure, VSD, ASD, minimal access transplant valve. So there is a place for each surgery. There is a role of CT for all these procedures. Um, so what do we do? I go first by coronary bypass grafting, then aortic valve replacement, then mitral procedure, and minimal access. And to explain what, what are we looking at when we are re uh, requesting a CT scan and wh wh what are we aiming uh, to see uh, the, the prior to the operation. So the bypass operation, which is about 60-70% of the procedures in the country, can be done on bypass or uh, by stopping the heart, off bypass, uh, off pump but on the beating heart, on pump, so we offload the heart but the heart is still beating, so on pump beating heart, minimal access bypass, it's a beating heart through small incision here, and multivessel uh, endoscopic uh, cardiac uh, coronary bypass. So the, the majority of surgeons, they do on-pump surgery, so they use this pump to uh, take the blood from the right side and re-inject it in the aorta. We cannot stop the heart by giving cold or warm cardioplegia. What other technique is using a, 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 an octopus, which is a system which will stabilize this area of the heart. And we do the graft, we put the artery in the middle of this. This is working by suction, so it's pulling up the epicardium, and then we do the graft in the middle of this uh, uh, octopus. So what the pump is doing, so the pump, as I said, take the blood out from the right side, we inject it in the aorta, we put a clamp just before this, this cannula, and we then give cardioplegia through the aorta to stop the heart. There is an oxygenator which will uh, re-oxygenate uh, the, uh, the blood and a heater, so either we will cool down the blood temperature up to 17 degrees in some cases where we do the arch surgery or we keep it warm or when it be cooling down then we are rewarming either slowly or quickly in function of different operations. Off pump procedure that's where we do mostly at Harefield. Uh, we use uh, the, 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 because since 2000 we believe off pump is far better than on pump because we don't get what we call a whole body inflammatory reaction which causes all these symptoms patients have post bypass uh, post cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, swelling brain, which gives a, 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 a change in behavior, not sleeping well, sweating, arrhythmia, more infection, uh, require more blood transfusion, more renal failure. So all these uh, risks, which are relay complications related to the heart-lung bypass machine by doing beating heart surgery, are really decreased. Um, the the technique we use, we use either an artery, which is an internal mammary artery, which is coming from subclavian artery, we put it on the main artery of the heart, which would be the LAD, or accessory uh, uh, grafts, which will be either vein or radial artery. We put the top end on the aorta and the distal anastomosis on the, uh, on the artery. So the vein would be mostly for the right coronary and circumflex, and the internal mammary mostly for the LAD. So again, the lima, we use it for LAD or OM because it doesn't reach the right coronary. The rima, uh, I will show on the picture how we reach this arteries on the LAD, OM or right. Saphenous vein can go on anything. 
we shouldn't put it on the LED unless if it damaged Rima or it has been uh, Lima or it has been used before. Radial artery, we have to use it only if the narrowing is more than 90%. Uh, even if an, this is an artery, if you use it on an artery which is between 70 and 90 percent narrow, there will be too much competitive flow and the radial artery will go down very quickly. In gastroepiploic artery, we really don't use it. We use it on PDA-OM when there is no more conduit left, the patient had previous bypass and um, they're all occluded. So the question is, before surgery, which conduit do we use? Artery? Which artery? Uh, internal mammary left or right, radial artery, or uh, saphenous vein. Do we use the internal mammary artery as a free or pedicle? And which type of anastomosis do we do? End-to-end, -end, sequential, T-graft, Y-graft, uh, all the variations I will show it to you. So the arterial conduits are far better. So why not everybody is doing total arterial? Because it takes time. It's much faster to do one IMA and two veins rather than two IMA and radial artery. So the arteries are very good for, for uh, mostly LAD and uh, right coronary for uh, the radial for right coronary. We have left and right internal mammary artery, radial artery, and gastroepiploic. It gives a long-term survival, and the patency rate is much longer than a vein. 20% uh, of the veins get blocked within the first six months of the operation. The disadvantage is uh, vasospasm, mostly for the radial artery. So the um, different type of graft, I mean, this figure is showing when we use, uh, when we do total arterial grafting. So you can have all the combination. That's why I think instead of writing the open note, I prefer to draw it because afterward, when the patient has a CT angiogram, you can have an idea of uh, how to look at the images uh, because sometimes it's not very clear. We have to see here, for example, left internal mammary artery comes to the LAD and then it's this uh, is a side to end anastomosis, side to side anastomosis, the end of it anastomosis to the radial artery going to the PDA in front of the heart. The rima goes behind the aorta, goes to the circumflex, and they take a T graft or Y graft uh, and we put it on the diagonal. So here we have all the combination and we can do it different way. We can put the rima to LAD, lima to OM, and radial from here to, to the um, to the right coronary artery. Uh, this is another type. So that was uh, that was two pedicle graft, and this one one free graft. So we take it off from here. Lima going to the uh, LAD, and the uh, rima we divide it in two branches. One going to the diagonal, and the other one going to the circumflex by doing two T graft. I don't like very much this one because I, I prefer having a full flow going to the LAD and having these arteries either going to the aorta or from coming from the, from the rima. This is gastroepiploic artery, so this is the heart. Here will be the diaphragm, we open, abdomen. Uh, you see that the incision is much bigger, and we take this artery here, we isolate the arteries, we make a hole in the diaphragm right here. Here is the edge of the heart, so lower down is the right coronary. And when we lift the heart up, we can see next to this vein the uh, PDA. So, and we have the we can do the anastomosis um, end to side. The radial artery now uh, the uh, we don't open the uh, this anymore. I have we do minimal access endoscopic, so we have a smaller incision. So we don't. This is quite old. So we just uh, make a tunnel here. We go all the way up here. With the endoscope, we cut all the branches and we take the vein out from here. Uh, we have less spasm and we hope longer patency rate. So how you recognize it on the angiogram, uh, like a vein, the radial artery, they have a lot of clips on it. So a vein, I, I, on my side, I would recognize it because there is less clip on a vein than on a radial artery. So when you have a lot of clips, it's usually radial artery because there are many small branches. Um, this is another one, Lima to a lady, and a T graft or Y graft, uh, the free Lima going to the OM, and angiographically would be like this. So the question is free or pedicle graft, skeletonized or non skeletonized? We often skeletonize the artery, the Lima, in order to get a better length and uh, less uh, spasm. Uh, anastomosis, different type, end to side end to end, 
sequential with the same graft we do bridging or a T graft or Y graft. For the vein, we don't do this anymore. I mean, that was up to 2007. Uh, the, uh, the one meter incision is now reduced to one centimeter. So with the camera again, on the egg, we go up here and down, all the way down here. That makes a huge difference in terms of recovery, pain, infection. Uh, the patients always remember the leg. Curiously, they never remember what happened here. A year later, they always say, they had a lot of pain, I couldn't walk, and the, all the infection we have, they are because they scratch the lung scar and they put it here. So that made a huge uh, difference in the recovery of patients. When we look at the patency rate of these arteries, uh, this was a, a study where all the patients had an angiogram. It's quite old, but that showed the patency rate of Lima vein and radial artery, which uh, should be still the same. So the in situ arteries, we have at five years 95% patency rate. For a free arterial, this is pedicle free arterial, like radial or free rima, would be about uh, between 85 90%, and a vein is about 80% at five years. And that is because, uh, as I said, 20% of the veins get blocked the first six months. And the rest, which is patent, it just continue to be patent. So uh, again, at five years, we, at, at seven years, uh, we have better patency rate with the uh, pedicle uh, IML and the vein. When we look at different uh, different conduits, the best. Uh, so the number is not a lot, but Lima and Rima are nearly the same. At five years, uh, we have uh, a 96 percent patency rate. Uh, radial artery is 90 percent. Uh, free internal uh, um, mammary arteries, 88% and 80%. So basically, Lima is the best, then uh, if the lesion is more than 90% radial artery and then the, uh, the vein. So on the CT scan, the internal mammary artery, uh, we can see just next to the edges of the sternum. Uh, we, and here, So I will let you explain that one. I just mentioned two things. When, when I ask for having a CT in these cases before the cabbage, often we discuss with uh, the committal regarding um, a patient, for example, comes for a bypass operation and had previous Hodgkin and had a radiotherapy. So I'm interested to know if the IMA is patent or not, especially if I want to do minimal access and I don't open the sternum, I don't have access to the rima. So it's quite interesting to know if the lima on this side is patent or not. Uh, another one would be if a patient had uh, stenosis, subclavian stenosis, and is known, I'm interested again to know if the IMA is uh, um, occluded, or a patient who had, uh, who's had dialysis and had a fistula, I want, I'm interested to know also again how big is the IMA, is it occluded, to do chronic dialysis or is still patent. So, yeah. so in this case, we can see that this is the left axillary artery coming down into left subclavian, and we can see the, re the lima is coming down fine. But on the right side, we don't see any contrast in the uh, axillary or the subclavian arteries, and nor is the rima being shown here. This patient basically has no contrast going down the rima. So if rima was to be used for surgery, that it cannot be used, but the lima is patent here. So uh, another thing, the patients who had breast cancer with radiotherapy, it's always interesting to, it's much better to know it beforehand than opening the chest and there is no internal mammary artery. Um, uh, the, the, the same here, so this is a, another thing is a very do redo procedure. Just it is quite interesting to know where the coronary, the, when they, if the grafts are patent, uh, whether or not they are patent, and where they are going to see the origin, uh, where are they going, and on which uh, target are they going. Not only the if they are patent, also looking at the native artery to see if uh, if they are uh, graftable or not. So another structure we look at is the aorta. Uh, for doing the top end, we need to la uh, clamp laterally the, uh, the aorta, it's, uh, and it's interesting to see if it is calcified or not, if it's dilated or not. 
um, the, and the, the position compare, compared to the sternum and also uh, the position compared, um, I will come to it, for the aortic surgery uh, because most of it is done through lateral incision compared to the edge of the sternum. <coughs> so, uh, lima graft, so uh, that would be the lima from subclavian artery going to the LAD and the two vein graft. So it's interesting sometimes to see if the artery is king, if the veins are king, if they're coming from here because some surgeon put them on the top and there is more kinking at the origin of these veins. And the, uh, for redo procedure, it's quite interesting. If you do a redo bypass operation, if for example, these two veins are blocked and the patient had lima to a lady patent, or if I'm doing aortic valve replacement and this patient had five years ago bypass, they are all patent. So I'm quite interested to, to see if I'm doing a valve replacement, I have to open the aorta between here and here. So I can have an idea beforehand and I need to clamp this IMA. Otherwise, if I clamp the aorta to go and bypass, this IMA will bring me warm blood in the heart. So the heart starts beating again. So I need to know where at which level I can go and clamp this internal mammary artery. So I know, for example, if I open the chest and I find this artery, the innominate artery, maybe two that centimeter down on the left side, I will have the IMS. So it's, it's much easier to go and to find it. And also if I know that these two arteries are here, I know that I can clamp quite on the top of this, put my cardioplegia between both and opening for my aortotomy here, much lower to have access to the aorta. So that gave me quite a lot of information before the operation. And I think we surgeons, we prefer the 3D images because that really anatomically shows exactly where the structures are. The, um, again, the lima graft is very important. We have more and more patients coming post-bypass for mitral valve surgery, aortic surgery, redo grafts, and it's quite useful to know where the, the conduit starts, where they go, and um, to, to which target they're going. You see also the relation to the sternum. When we do a redo, uh, it is in some surgeon, they just put a long lima, something like that, going to their lady, coming all the way here. So then when we go, do redo operation and we want to do a sternotomy, we are in this situation where the IMA is right behind the sternum. So as soon as we open, and in many of these patients, the native arteries are occluded, and the only graft which is working is lima to a lady, which is retrogradely filling the other one. So you can imagine if you do sternotomy and we open he, he, this, we damage this a lady, the patient dies on the table and we can't, we can't open the chest. So it's quite useful to know where is it going exactly, uh, over which lengths. And here, for example, we know we have to be careful and we have about two millimeter space. We can still do it, but and to know exactly at which level of the sternum uh, we have to do the, um, the op opening. So that is also to show the T graft, the lima to a lady, and a T graft uh, with probably uh, an internal mammary artery. The radial would be a bit bigger than this. And this one is, I think, a rima to a lady. Because mm, so that is uh, the rima coming from subclavian artery in front of the aorta, pulmonary artery, going to the lady here and the lima going to the circumflex. Uh, and so here, uh, Tan, I think it will be your here. Yeah. Just showing the difference between arterial and venous graphs. So as two friends said earlier that uh, one of the differences is arterial radial graph particularly will mm -hmm. have a lot of clips. So and the other thing I look at is the caliber of the graph. So generally the arterial graph will be smaller and uniform in caliber with multiple clips, while venous graphs will be larger in size with less clips to them. So those are the two main differences. And sometimes people think that there could be valves in the venous graphs, but that's not true, right? No, they, they, they really don't have valves. No. So you... Um, uh, I was... I don't know if you can... That's going to work. I will it's show that. I'm not, I'm not, I don't think this movie is on. That was a beating hard, but yeah. I mean, so the role of CT would be for graph patency, the trajectory of the graph, the position of IMA compared to the sternum, 
to the uh, pulmonary artery, to left atrial appendage, uh, because often they are long, they might go down next to the left atrial appendage and coming up to the lady, to look at the proximal anastomosis to the aorta and to the native arteries. Um, so uh, that to look at the patency of the graft, the quality of the distal anastomosis, and I was saying about the native artery also, many times we, we discussed in the, in the MDT about a patient that, who had an angiogram, the, the left main stem is quite hazy, we're not sure if it is tight, the patient still has symptoms, angina, and we're not convinced it is really narrow. And, and I think the pressure wiring is good, but we often like to do a CT scan to see if the, if the left main stem is narrowed or not, and it's very, it's very helpful, that allows to, to have a second confirmation in front of a suspicion of a stenosis of a left main, and then uh, and with a negative CT, so we can say that we're not going ahead with the procedure. So acute graft occlusion, uh, would be the clot, if I'm not wrong, uh, yeah. within the within the vein graft coming from uh, from the aorta. Going, this is going to the right coronary artery, yeah. and that would be the so the aneurysm of uh, the uh, the the graft uh, from the right coronary graft, which would be uh, here. So. Usually, sometimes some patients they have varicose vein, and when we, we usually should take a good vein with good quality. This is not a good vein. It is quite large here, becomes smaller here, with a bit of aneurysm at this level. So we should avoid putting this type of uh, vessels. Uh, chronic occlusion. So this is just a stump. Just showing chronically occluded graft. So this is an example of a stump here in the graft. And you, you can see this graft to the RC has got multiple clips, so this could well be an arterial graft going down. Yeah. And that's a look. Okay, so this is showing a uh, graft uh, going towards the marginal branch. And you can see this is a stem. There are two stents here. One stent is this one, which is patent with contrast in it. And this is a second stent with quite uh, lower intensity material, low density material, which is suggestive of instant restenosis. And this is another example of occluded graphs here. Just clips are seen, and no contrast is seen in the uh, graph themselves. And this is this slide is showing the heavy calcification that the native arteries proximal to the graphs undergo because there is less blood flowing through them, and it can be quite difficult to evaluate them. And in fact, if the graph itself is patent, then we don't need to evaluate the native body arteries proximally. And so this is you want to yeah. say that so the role of ct and geography in bypass graft patient so you can say after after an unsuccessful angiogram to identify graft that have not been seen on the invasive angiogram then as a first line investigation ct can be used to check the patency of graft anastomosis native arteries distal to anastomosis and ungrafted arteries and ideally, you want to combine CTA, anatomical tests like CTA angiogram, with uh, an a stress imaging test. And then one can, and then uh, a targeted catheter angiogram can be performed based on the result of the combined test. I think that's an ideal way of using the non-invasive techniques. Yep. Uh, the, the, I'll put the mid cap on the top. It's just sometimes we have a completely occluded lady, retrograde is filled, but the, we, we, we uh, oh, the retrogradely is not filled. So antegradely, the, there is a stop in the middle of the LAD. Retrogradely is not filled, and there is no scar. So there should be an LAD somewhere, and the patient has angina. And it is useful to have a, a, a CT in order to see if we can find the LAD. Uh, and if we find it, we, then we can go ahead with the with, with the procedure. In terms of that, so. The valve, everybody familiar, mitral tricuspid, pulmonary aortic valve, uh, so by the aortic valve, either tricuspid, false bicuspid, or a true bicuspid aortic valve. Uh, this is a true bicuspid, heavily calcified, uh, more uh, less circular than the uh, false uh, bicuspid, with a uh, sometimes calcification uh, reaching the uh, coronary ostia. Different type of valves are available. We use all of them, except the, maybe this one, we don't use it anymore, and this one, we don't use it in our institution. 
the mechanical valves. We have this old star valves, so sometimes patients come and we take them away and we put the new one, which is uh, uh, the, the other mechanical bilifted valve. We use less and less mechanical valve. Even more younger patients, they want uh, tissue valve because the new version of tissue valve, they last for about 15 years. And another new version is coming, which is uh, uh, supposed to comparing uh, in animal uh, with, with the, with the magna is uh, with this one. It is supposed to last up to 20, 25 years. So we do about 20, 15 to 20 mechanical a year, which is not a lot uh, compared to about 200 of tissue valve. The biological valve, we have all this with the biological group. Uh, biological stented, so there is a metallic stent around it, and they made with the pericardium, which is taken, treated in glutaraldehyde, so they kill all the cells. There is no antigenicity, and that's a valve which is most used in the country, about 80% of the valve. Uh, the other two valve where we change the valve and the root, and we reimplant the coronary arteries here. It's the biological stentless from <coughs> peak, and animal, uh, and the human one would be the homograft. Uh, the, um, today we know that the long-term result of these two are nearly similar, is about 15 to 20 years. We have patients 30 years ago, Magdi Yacoub did a homograft on them and still is working very well. The, uh, we don't have many homographs uh, uh, at the moment, therefore we keep the homograft only for endocarditis with root abscess. Uh, because if you use any of these in the case of infection with root abscess, the patient will have reinfection. The only valve which is protecting from reinfection is homograft. And the reason is all this muscle will be, if the annulus is infected with an abscess, we put the valve into the LVOT and we completely exclude the annulus with abscess. So we keep this one for endocarditis with root abscess. Any other endocarditis is a biological stentless. In a very young patients, 40 year old, for example, uh, I use biological stentless because it lasts 15, 20 years. And why this works better than this one? Uh, they are both pig valves. The reason is in this in this valve, the hemodynamic we will put a valve into a, a patients with a different valsalva. So the the while here the valve and the valsalva is from the same animal, so the hemodynamic is respected. So that's the only reason this valve, valve and root, lasts longer than this one. This is about 12 years, this is 15 to 20 years. The new valve we have, you will see more and more, there are these two. This is the Edwards valve. Uh, it's a sutureless with a stent underneath. It will sit on <coughs> supraannular position and the stent gets open. And this one, the stent will open in the aorta up to here. So, uh, the, and the reason I don't use it, because this valve uh, in this version doesn't last long time, eight years. So to me, this is not going to last longer. Uh, and also the stent is sitting up to here. So if you have to do a redo, it's a root replacement and the valve. While in this case, if you do a redo operation, it's only aortic valve replacement. So these valves are for minimal access aortic surgery. Other procedure, mitral tricuspid valve repair. So uh, the mitral bileaflet, uh, opening, closing, the mitral structure would be, is not only leaflets, is leaflets, annulus, corde, papillary muscle, left ventricle. Uh, the whole structure is assessed uh, during mitral valve surgery. We check the mechanism and uh, by the three classification of Carpentier, those first group, the movement of leaflet are expected, second one exaggerated, type three restricted. So we have different techniques, either we preserve this, we put artificial corda. When there is excess of tissue like in Barlow, we reject it. If we reject triangularly, we just do edge to edge closure. If, we, if the patient doesn't have much ish, uh, tissue, we do sliding uh, by bringing these two edges together. We always put a ring because after chronic regurgitation, the annular shape goes from this shape into the circular shape, so we reshape the annulus always with a mitral ring, which is always a complete ring. And the tricuspid is the one, if you see it, the one which is incomplete is a tricuspid. Uh, more and more, we do the operation through minimal access. If this is the head, that will be the diaphragm at this level. Usually the incision goes from here up to here. 
So we cannulate on femoral and on jugular. We do an incision which is about that much. So through here, we do the mitral repair, tricuspid repair, left atrial appendage closure from inside the left atrium, and, uh, and ablation. So that's what we get. This is a retractor. This is a camera. This is a clamp. We clamp the aorta inside, and the cardioplegia going to the aorta comes out from here. The, so the CT for... Um, For the yeah, the aortic yes. Absolutely. So you know we use CT a lot for any patient with suspected aortic um, disease, particularly dilatation of the aortic root, uh, sending aorta, etc., to measure the dimensions of these structures uh, precisely, and uh, and also to exclude in the younger patients uh, who are going for aortic surgery any any coronary artery disease. So for both purposes, CT and geography is useful. And also, we are now doing more and more CT and geography with ECG gating in patients with uh, suspected aortic root abscess. And you can see here, this is uh, this is an aortic root abscess uh, on, on the coronal view. This is aortic root abscess on the same patient on a, uh, on a short axis view of the aortic valve. And you can see this patient has had a previous biologically stented uh, AVR. Uh, and the, one of the complications of you know any of the valves is uh, uh, infective endocarditis with aortic root abscess. So if we find CT as a very good complementary mm -hmm. technique along with POE uh, Just, for these patients. So one more thing: this patient, for example, coming for surgery, definitely we should not put tissue valve. It just has to be homogram, and it's important to see the LVOT and the quality on the CT because then the homograph we can't put the valve anymore. The annulus is here. We have to put it here. So the suture will go here, up to here, somewhere here, and we exclude all this area. So it's quite interesting to know where the abscess is, how far it is going on this side or into the septum, and if you have enough space to put the homograph in the, in the LBOT. And for type A dissection, CT is, I would say, probably the gold standard technique to define the extent of dissection, to look at uh, uh, extent into the head and neck vessels, uh, extent into the coronary arteries to define any points of tear, like in this case here, large tear. So CT is very useful for all of that. Yeah. Yeah, so that what we're looking also is the extent of the section. If there is a hemopericard, aortic regurgitation, left floral effusion, and ST changes. That is in general for the aortic dissection. Uh, where does it start, where it goes, and to make the difference between the true dissection and the hematoma, uh, subadvantageal hematoma. So the other procedures, uh, we went through a quick, well, minimal access, applies to everything. Applies to everything, and we need the CT in most of these patients because we don't have access to the structure. We are aiming to reach only the, the target, either for bypass, we reach the LAD, for the aortic or mitral or tricuspid or for maze procedure. So uh, for endoscopic uh, vein harvesting is the same. We used to have this, this is gone. Now the same similar patient with the same, we get one centimeter and we avoid all this uh, problem, infection of the sternum. All this is related to the big opening and diabetic patient. So all this is gone. So usual sternotomy is transformed to mid cap here, mitral here, aortic would be here. That's the way we do the endoscopic procedure is done. So I put ports here, open it once IMA is harvested, then we open. So you can see if a patient has a breast cancer, it's quite important for me to know if this is there before putting all the pro port in it and going and see there is nothing. That's the usual mid-cap incision. That is the thoracotomy for ASD repair. And so a limited access valve, which is done more and more through either a mini sternotomy, very obese patient, or a limited thoracotomy on the right side. So that one, I have a video, so it's quite, I mean, if you, um, There's something, something, something. no, 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 because we never know what we say. Mm. It's, <laughs> so that, that, that is a, that's an opening about three fingers in the right intercostal space. So I need to know about the IMA here because I'm going to cut it. And I need to know the sternum, uh, the usual incision being here. 
So I need to see the edge of the sternum and to see how far is the aorta. And some patients, the heart is completely pushed away and I can't have access to the aorta. And you see when I open here, the pericardium is open, the aorta is right in front. So it, it, it is, and uh, we cannulate either in the femoral artery or directly through, uh, through here. So we have all the structure which I need for aortic valve replacement there. So the CT will not only show where the aorta is positioned compared to my incision, but also the coronary arteries if they're normal or not. Because if there is a doubt on angiogram, I really need to know if the patient needs a bypass or not. If it needs, I have to do a sternotomy. So just to show you, this is an aortic valve. We went to the endoscope, so we remove, this is a calcified aortic valve, rigidly flat. So this will be the right coronary cusp, that will be the left, and that's the uh, non-coronary cusp. So all the uh, calcifications are removed, and that's a sutureless, because that will be the valve the, in the future everybody will use. You completely decalcify the valve. On the back here, the white, there is, this is the mitral valve from the ventricular side. So complete decalcification of the annulus. Uh, and then we size it and we put the valve, we put three stitches to direct the valve into the, um, into the annulus and uh, then we put a balloon, a, a bit like the like, like cavi. So uh, the three stitches are placed and we, this are to expose the valve. So we put the stitches in the commission and we pull the whole structure upward and you put the valve in, the stent is underneath, it's sitting in supraannular position and uh, then we deploy the aortic valve. So that's why you see how it is it's quite interesting to know on the CT if this ascending aorta is calcified or not. If it's calcified, I'm not going to do this technique. It's interesting to know this area, how large is the, uh, the, the beginning of root if it's a small root or if it's a big root. Uh, the other day I did a patient who had Hodgkin with a, 20 years ago with a lot of radiotherapy and uh, I, I wanted to do mini access here but I went mini sternotomy and, and the reason it was on the CT, the aorta due to radiotherapy was quite uh, uh, strong and it was quite small and I had to do the root at the same time than the aortic valve. So, and so the structure we need to see is aorta, the quality of the aorta, the position of the aorta and internal mammary artery. And obviously it's even better if you see the right atrium, which is uh, there. Um, maybe I'll go to the next. All right, so all the, I think, there we are. So all these patients, you will see them in the future. Aortic valves are done this way, mitral valve, endoscopy. <laughs> This is aortic valve with incision here. This is totally endoscopic AF ablation. There are the mitral. This is also aortic valve midline. This is a bypass operation. So more and more, we are going more and more toward less invasive procedure. And for each of these cases, we need a CT, CT uh, way to see the IMA and the aorta and the other structure is crucial. I mean, nowadays, uh, nearly 80% of the patient, if he didn't have um, limitation in, in, in uh, the number of CT we need to do, ideally all the mini access needs need to have um, a CT scan. Thank you. Thank you very much.